please remain standing. We'll shift from something that's very contemporary and modern to something that's ancient and, and one of the foundational truths or statements of the faith of Christianity through the ages and around the globe. The Apostles' Creed has let us stand and, or remain standing and affirm our faith together in God. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Before you may be seated, before we uh, sing our, our next uh, hymns, I just had a thought and I wanted to say a word about someone who's with us this morning, several someones, I guess. Uh, as we were saying that uh, affirmation of faith, as we were repeating it, and I believe in the communion of, uh, of the saints, that uh, an image came to my mind of people who've gone before you and sat in these pews, people who now the scripture says are looking on and cheering us on to persevere people, family members, and friends, and loved ones, people who've had an influence in our lives through the, through the decades. They are present with us today. And we have someone who's traveled from South Texas just to be here. Ms. Joyce, you need to stand up. That's part of the fellowship, the communion of, of the saints. And then we have a family that's traveled all the way from Ontario, Canada, just to be with you this morning. Is that right? Ontario, is that right? Alberta. Alberta, that's even further. Came here just to be at Grace this morning. So you're blessed. Uh, Gary? They heard we were doing a live <laughs> Y'all can remain seated for this one.
stand together and sing I will worship you. stewardship of all that God has blessed us with, our days, our lives, our talents, our time, our finances. Our stewardship of all these things is guided by the grace of God at work in our lives and the need of the day and the hour. You'll find a scripture from the book of Proverbs printed in your bulletins. We will recite it together before we continue to worship with the receiving of God's tithes and offer it. So from Proverbs chapter 22, verse 9. Let us join together. He who is generous will be blessed, for he gives some of his food to the poor.
please stand. be seated. Would the children come down for the children's sermon? so y'all can see what I'm talking about. I'll get right here. Do y'all like muck puzzles? Yeah. How about mazes and things like that? I brought a maze with me, and I'm going to let Miss Robin take these for y'all to work them in children's church if you want. But you start at the beginning, and you start to go, and you try to find a path away around through it, and sometimes you take the wrong turn, and what do you have to do then? Go back or start over or try again, and so you have to back up and find the way to. So you keep going till you get all the way out. You can't just go through. You just go, go draw a line straight through. Do you can cross over all the lines? You have to follow the rut lines and go around and everything. And I really like to do these. I haven't done one of these in quite a while, but I do enjoy. I loved it when I was a kid doing it. But sometimes we've got a brand new year going, and God has a plan for us through our year. And we go along and we do things and we think we're following a right path and sometimes we run into trouble or we have a problem. And why do you think that might be? Are we listening to God to tell us directions which way to go sometimes? No, I don't always listen. So I think I know better and I'm just going to go straight across that line and just go right out and I'll get to the finish line just, it's just fine. Doesn't work that way, does it? Mm -mm. God is there with us. There's a um, verse in the book of Isaiah that I copied down here. It says, whether you turn to the right or to the left, your he ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. God is right there with us trying to show us which way to go. I may not always listen to him, but I need to listen to him. And I need to pray and say, okay, I've got a big decision. I need to decide, do I want to go this way? Do I want to go that way? Do I want to talk to this person? Do I want to act that way? How do I want to be as a person? And God is there ready to talk to you at any time. He will help you. You don't just can't just barrel your way through because things you'll get in a dead end and then you got to backtrack and try again. But God is always there with you, always willing to help you anytime you need him. So I hope you all have a great year. I know school is back in and you all are so happy about that. <laughs> you all pray with me, please. Dear Lord, as we travel throughout this year and through our life, we ask you to help us follow the plan you have for our lives. We don't always know which way to turn, but help us to listen, to hear your voice guiding us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Good morning. Some of you may know me, but for those who don't, I'm Benjamin Bourgeois, and Grace Church allowed me to go to the Ghana mission. I'd have to say that the best part about the mission was meeting all the new people. These people countered problems head on, and they showed love endlessly. They showed God's love daily and showed it to everyone. And two of these people are here today with us, and they would like to share the Ghana mission with y'all. And I'd like to welcome Hattie and Joey Romero to Grace Church. Thank you for that, Ben. Uh, ben and his two partners in crime Uh, landed in, uh, it was a really unique, we've had a lot of teams come and uh, over the years uh, over a hundred different people have been in and out and served with us there and it was the first time that we had a team that never had a chance to meet uh, all together and stateside before they had a chance to go and uh, or at least a large segment of we had three from Ruston, uh, one from Houston, one from the south end of Toledo Bend Lake, and one from San Antonio. And the first time they met was when they, they met in Ghana, uh, I think at the airport. Is that right? They all flew in the same flight. So uh, it was an interesting group. They did a great job. And uh, uh, thank you so much for allowing them uh, to serve us uh, in Ghana, West Africa. We're going to spend some time in God's Word this morning. I hope you're ready for that. If you have a co your copy of Scripture with you, I encourage you to get it out. If you don't have your copy of Scripture with you, I would encourage you to, I th do y'all have a few Bibles here, I think? Uh, use those, uh, uh, if you will. We'll be reading from the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 17. Some of you may have that, you know, the Bible on your phone. If I see glowing faces, that's a good sign. And... Uh, uh, I have that too, and, uh, but I still love the pages. Got me a new Bible this morning. It's the first time that I'm having a chance to preach from it. Uh, but again, we'll be in uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 17. And this is, a, uh, to me, one of the most important, one of the most special places in the Bible because in this place, at the end of Jesus' ministry, John records this prayer. And Jesus basically... Uh, is facing the cross and that's coming at him and these disciples are hearing him pray and not only just any prayer I'm sure they've heard him pray over and over again as, as they walk they, they, they saw him pray and they wanted him to teach them how to do that and here we have an opportunity to see the Lord's prayer being done by the Lord himself. We're not going to look at all of it, but it's constructed in three uh, segments. One is Jesus prays for himself. Again, he's facing the cross. The second thing he prays for is he prays for the disciples that have been following him. This group of people that, have, that if you will, have, have hung in there with him all the way to the end when a lot of people left him. They're there. And then he does something that I think is incredible for me and you. He prays for me and you. Isn't that amazing? I mean, if you think about it, you've, you've asked, I'm sure you've asked for people to pray for you in your life. I have. I need that. I need that from you. You need that from me. And Jesus knew we needed prayer. And here he specifically prays for me and you. And that's where we're going to be looking at, beginning in verse 17. Would you read with me? Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. For their sakes I sanctify myself that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. Let me say a few things about this, and then we'll finish the reading. When I went to how to be a preacher school, 
And they were teaching me how to look at a passage of scripture. One of the things they said you need to hone in on is words that are repeated over and over. God's trying to hammer away at something here and you need to pay attention to this. And here in these short passages that we're looking at, he repeats the same word three different times in the word sanctify. In Greek, it's hagios. It, 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 it's the same thing, the same word we get holiness from. So I want to take a moment here and define it for you in its simplicity because it's a very simple word to define. It simply means something that's set apart from everything else. So if I've got a group of rocks in my hand over here and I take one of the stones and I separate it over here into this hand, this rock has been sanctified. It's separated off. But here he's talking about something specific. There's a reason for sanctification and that's what we're going to be looking at for this morning. What have we been set apart for? So let's continue reading. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, these alone being the, the, the disciples. This is where he tells me and you that he prays for us. But for those who also who believe in me through their word. That's me and you. So if you have trusted the word of God, if you have Embrace the message of the gospel that basically is in agreement between you and God. He has told you and you have received the message that yes, you are in sin. And that you have no solution for the problems that causes. And the problems that causes is, is you're headed for hell. And God provided his son. And he took your sin. As Paul writes, he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God through him. If you've trusted that and allowed Jesus to take what you could not pay for and pay for it himself and you've said, I give myself to that. I, I, I belong to you. I trust what God's done on the cross. Then this prayer is for you. So here he says, who would believe in the words that they would share after him? That's me and you. That what? Verse 21. That they may all be one. Can you say that with me? That they may all be one. Can you say it with me again? That they may all be one. How so? Even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. Let's continue reading for a couple of verses. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them that they may be one. He repeats that again, just as we are one. Remember that repeated word thing? This is important. He's hammering away at something here. I and them and you and me that they may be perfected, completed, if you will, in unity. So that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. Wow, what an incredible message. And you know what's more incredible for me? What's more incredible for me is knowing that Jesus' prayers are on target. He's not praying for something that's not going to come. He's praying for something that is going to come, and he's asking on, on, on mine and your behalf. And let me tell you, oneness is not something I'm experiencing and seeing around me. Are you seeing it? I mean, it's a real struggle to look on the news today or to even look in our culture and find unity. In fact, in fact we find just the opposite. we got families dividing, churches dividing, our country is dividing. We have news agencies that represent the divisions. And they're feeding off of it, and we're feeding it. It's a problem. And yet Jesus prays for us to be one. How can we... In the culture that we are coming into this day, see this come to pass. Because as we are set about in holiness, he has set us apart for oneness. What kind of oneness is that? I... Uh,
We could talk about things today that give us, I guess, our struggle, if you will. And maybe even empty the church. We could talk about the wall. I mean, that'd be a good start if we wanted to see a march. But we could even break it down even closer and talk about uh, things within the church that divide us. Abortion. Sharp divisions, even within God's church. We could talk about salvation. A simple message of salvation that comes from God's word and it has divided churches. We have this church over here that has this recipe for that. And they exist over here because those guys over there got it wrong in their vision. And Jesus is saying that if the world is going to know that he was sent to save it, then they're going to know that by our unity, not our division. Do you see that in the passage that we just read? That's what he's saying. Are we exemplifying that in God's church? It's a good question. It's a good topic to explore. It's a good reason to look at holiness. I used to think of holiness as this person who never did anything wrong. That was my vision of it. You know? And there were certain people that were kind of like that. But let me tell you, if you take a really close look, you're not going to find holiness in people. Holiness resides in God and his son and in people who are found in him is what this teaches. And I want you to look at the example that he gives us. He tells us that we will find a picture of perfect holiness in the relationship that Jesus had with the father. Do you see that in the passage? How so? Well, I want to go through some things with you about oneness in that relationship with the Father. One is what it's not. Oneness is not equal rank. Jesus accepted that he was under the authority of the Father. It didn't make him less. It certainly didn't make him more. But it absolutely did not make them of equal rank. Oneness does not mean equality of rank. Oneness also doesn't mean the same role. The Father in heaven and the Son on earth did not have the same role. They both had their parts to play and they played them perfectly. That's what gave them perfect unity. So if it's not what me and you are seeking, and I see that in the world today, we have what our culture, if you go to Sociologists who study cultures in the world, they'll tell you that America is probably an egalitarian nation is what they would call it. Where we hold up being the same and being equal and no one over another person really in high regard. To the extent now where if children are coming up, we shouldn't tell them they're a boy or a girl. We should let them decide because they need to have equal access to whatever, irregardless of their biology. That's the extreme of egalitarianism that our nation has gone in. We've held it up that high. And we just don't see that in oneness between the Father and the Son. Oneness is this. And if you've got a pencil and you'll write it down, I'd encourage you to. This is just the definition that comes from our scriptures and what I'm going to fulfill the rest of our time speaking about this morning. Oneness is common purpose. Fulfilled Jesus' way by a focused team. Let me repeat that again. Oneness is common purpose. Fulfilled Jesus' way by a focused team.
Well, what is that purpose? You should be asking that question. So if you've got your Bibles and you want to turn with me, turn with me to the book of Genesis chapter 1. We're going to be reading in verse 26. Genesis chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. Jesus, uh, God has created here. He has created all six days. This is day six where we're going to be reading. And it's in the middle of day six or at the end of day six. I'm not sure what, but I, I know we're going to be reading about the last thing that he creates. He's created everything else. And in Genesis chapter 1, and my pages in my Bible are still sticky. Beginning in verse 26, he gives our purpose. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and every, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. What words do you see repeated over and over again? Created. created. Only God can do that. And he's got a purpose in everything he does. What other word do you see repeated over and over again? Image. That's our purpose. We exist to be like God. So when you think of holiness, that's what we've been set apart for. Our entire existence on this earth was intended to be set apart so that we might spread the glory and the goodness of God throughout his creation. That's why we're here. So the thing that made God the Father and God the Son one was common purpose because Jesus was sent to this world to show the world the image of God. And that's the reason he asked me and you to follow him. There's only one way, and it's his way. Not the American way or the Ghanaian way. The white way or the black way, the Democrat and the Republican way, Jesus' way. And if we want to find oneness, the way we see it in Scripture, we're going to have to find a way. And I hope that when we look for it, we find Jesus. It's His way that brings us into oneness. And when we fulfill our purpose by doing that, great joy erupts in those that find it. Because there's no greater joy that humanity can find themselves in than walking in the real purpose for which they were made. You ever tried to do a job that you're not made for? And the misery that comes with that and then somewhere along the line you find this job that you really are good at. And the joy that comes from finding it. When me and you find the common purpose and the way to get it accomplished through seeing Jesus Christ in life. And setting our life apart so that we might become what we see in Jesus. Then great joy erupts in me and you. But unfortunately, there is so much out there, and I call it the noise of the world. And if you ever want to find a place that's noisy of the world, come to America. You experience it day in and day out, but I go away from this. And I'm telling you, it's more difficult for me to walk as Jesus walked when I come here than it is when I go to Ghana. Because of the busyness and the choices and the wealth and all those things that it brings. Crowd out the person of Christ in my life when I come back to the States. And you exist in it every day. How do you find oneness? And what are some things that are happening here? 
that are fighting us in becoming one. The lost art. I want you to look at a passage for me, and we're not going to look at because, you know, if we wanted to study holiness today, it would be the entire life of Christ. You wouldn't have time for that. So I'm going to focus on a couple of things today. Turn with me to Mark chapter 14. We're going to be reading in verse 36. Mark chapter 14, verse 36. <clears throat> 